making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, we still have a long way to go. They promise to bring us more revenue and quality, promise to bring us more revenue and quality, promise to bring us more revenue and quality, Winston is now on its way. Yes, dear, we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, yes, dear, we're making more progress now, Second will help us all out. They promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Winchester's now on its way. I'm not positive. It's a jam-packed program once again. I played the song up front because I've been asked by a lot of people to play it. That's the one I took and changed the words to, and I'll keep changing the words to it as we move along, as long as I keep having the programs and we make progress. Today we got a great show. There's a lot of progress has been made. Uh, first thing I'll do is make a few comments. You'll see Sherlock Holmes up there in the back of me. Today I've got a uh, couple hundred year old pipe here, part of my Sherlockiana collection. and. Um, it's the kind of pipe he used to smoke. It's a meerschaum, and I got it in England at some antique store many years ago. Um, I have another prop here, which I'll show later when we get farther into the show. Um, the, uh, then I'm going to talk about the exceptional progress that we've been making in the last five weeks or so with the new selectmen and the new team. Uh, and we're very, very tickle pink with that. They're really making some progress. I'm going to talk about the critical path for the Quantum Leap, which is the Enterprise Corridor. We talked about that last week. Uh, I want you to know, this week I prepared for 60 hours, a whole program, and I, uh, the other night I woke up about 1 in the morning and with a brilliant idea to change the whole program, so I've done that. I, I stayed up all night in the coffee shops writing the program, and, uh, and uh, we, we uh, got snowed out yesterday, so I'm here on Friday afternoon recording it. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about my view on what I would do and how I think we can move forward. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the critical activities for the Enterprise Corridor, other activities that are necessary as well. At the same time, we call those the non-critical activities, which may become critical if we're not careful. Um, I'm going to have a chart, uh, show you what a CPM chart looks for, like, a critical path method chart I've been using for about 50 years, and uh, the technique, not the uh, chart. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to talk a bit of, about a benefit of this approach. And then I, watch, I went, went to go to a meeting the other night, and uh, I won't tell you which one it was, but there was a meeting, went on until about 11.30 at night. So I went home and I wrote up another couple slides, which are called How to Run an Efficient Meeting. I don't think meetings should go to 11.30. It's not fair on the people who attend and want to be there, and it's not fair on the commissioners who have to get up at 5 in the morning to do to go to work. So I'm going to talk a bit about that and um, I hope it's something that will help you. 
I want to add a couple little comments first. I was going to talk about them at more length, but tonight I can just touch, touch on them. Um, one is facts. And uh, businessmen, and hence the majority of our newly appointed selectmen, prefer to deal with facts, not supposition. There have been some instances of statements where facts have, uh, have or can be questioned at the selectmen meetings. And I think I saw four or five examples of that. If I get time in the future, I'll go over those. But uh, it's even little things that don't count too much, like how much somebody is paying uh, on their reval, which is, was off by about uh, a pretty good percentage. So I th it got, also got in the paper. I read the paper today, and it had a fallacious number in there. So I think people have to be careful when they deal at the selectmen meetings, and they always make sure they check their facts out first. Because I can tell you, the businessmen are checking the facts out and will continue to do so. Responsibility. I saw in the paper over the last week or two where the Board of Education, uh, which has been delegated the responsibility of dealing with the contractual negotiations uh, with the unions and the uh, arbitrators, um, um, there are some comments in there that uh, were made by people, well, at least one person from, the, from uh, the Board of Education that perhaps shouldn't have been made in the paper. Uh, that my view is when you're delegated authority, this goes for all everybody in town that works in town, not just the uh, board, of, board of Education, but when you're delegated authority, you should get on with it. Accept that responsibility and, and get on with it. And uh, don't make any unhelpful comments, especially to the newspapers, because that doesn't help our image. And it's part of this hospitality um, uh, um, theory that I keep telling you about. We, we can't be making those kind of comments. Let's work it out within our own home. If you've got a question, just call somebody and talk to them about it or have a meeting with them. Don't run to the newspapers. That's like running to daddy. We don't like to run to daddy in business. Today's guest is Sherlock Holmes. Pictures in the background at 221B Upper Baker Street, London, England, where now a statue stands. And I used to go by it every day a few years ago when I was uh, consulting over in England. Uh, down in the city of London. Um, uh, actually, Upper Baker Street is in, in the city of London. It's in the outskirts there. But um, uh, I was staying in an apartment in that area. It was rented by the company. Um, there's, uh, in study, the study in Scarlet was the first uh, uh, where we introduced Sherlock Holmes. Arthur Conan Doyle introduced him. Remember, I told you once before, he was patterned after his, uh, one of Conan Doyle's teachers at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And his name was Dr. Joseph Bell. And uh, he actually practiced a lot of these techniques uh, that were used. And there is a quote in one of his first handwritten drafts of A Study in Scarlet. I'm not even positive it made it into the final. But uh, it said, I must say, he's quoting Sherlock Holmes here, I must say that I have no patience with people who build up fine theories in their armchairs, which can never be reduced to practice. Tonight we're going to be talking a lot about evolution versus revolution in practice in the city, in the town of Winchester. So I wanted, I thought that would be a pretty appropriate quotation. Um, and uh, as Sherlock Holmes would say, we in the, in the, in the, in the uh, town of Winchester, city of Winchester, town of Winchester, city of Winston, I keep getting them mixed up, uh, this is a two-pipe problem. Sherlock Holmes always, uh, uh, you know, always assigned uh, um, all of a pipe value to all his problems. And, you know, I think this is probably a two-pipe problem. And uh, I'm not positive of that, but it could be a ten-pipe problem. But we'll find out as we go along. So now I want to talk a bit about the uh, selectmen and the exceptional progress they've been making. First, I'll tell you, I want to remind you of what the problem we have in, in is. And the problem is, over the last ten years, as I've been saying all along here for my 12 programs, we have been breaking even at best while our town has been fighting deterioration despite the gallant efforts of those concerned. A lot of people trying to do good, good here, but uh, because we were poor, you know, and breaking even over 10 years, uh, we really don't uh, have the money to do a lot of things. The solution, in my opinion, accelerate the revenue growth by expanding the taxpayer base responsibly as rapidly as possible. As I said last week, it's not just good enough to grow the grand list, net grand list. You got to grow it with profitable uh, more taxpayers that aren't a big drain on the town and, uh, and, and pay, pay a hefty amount of tax. So that's what we're looking for. And uh, we can evolve to it, and we have to evolve to it. We have no other choice. But we're also saying part of our evolution should be a grand leap or two somewhere along the way. 
Okay, the new, since they've uh, been appointed or elected, the new selectmen have brought us a sense of urgency second to none. These guys are working hard. They're just like everybody else in town. They're uh, donating their time. They have full-time businesses to run. But boy, they're spending a lot of time nights and weekends, just like everybody else that's trying to help the town. And um, they have a, a tremendous sense of urgency, and they really have uh, been working uh, hard, and they know they have to move quickly. Some people are concerned about that, but don't be concerned about it because when you're in intensive care, the doctors need to move quickly, and so do the nurses. Um, number two, there's the rapid yet responsible decision making. They are making decisions. Remember, I, I talked about results orientation a bit last week, not as much as I wanted to, but uh, uh, matter of fact, since I see he's got the camera over there, I better put up this slide for you. Uh, the, uh, I sometimes lose track of where the cameras are, but um, so we have rapid yet responsible decision making. We really need to make decisions and we need to make them fast because we're going down the slope of that triangle and all the tough decisions are in the beginning, not at the end. So that's what's happening now. Uh, they have a thirst for the facts. They want to know facts. I mentioned earlier in the program, facts are very important. When I first started in business, well, a fellow in Italy gave me a, a Pinocchio. I still have it at home. Maybe I'll bring it in next week and show it to you. Pinocchio, he said to me, Brian, you need to always concentrate on the facts. And you make sure your nose doesn't grow like Pinocchio. And he gave me the Pinocchio. I've had it all these years. I still have it at my house. And one of my favorite collections is a little po Pinocchio collection. We've got one hanging now on our Christmas tree. Um, thirst for the facts. Um, Got to deal with facts. And it is, you know, if you don't deal with facts and you get caught out, then people won't believe you anymore after that and uh, you won't be very influential. You got to check for facts. When somebody tells me that they pay so much or they got so much increase in their evaluation, I go look at it on the computer and I see what the real fact is. And in some cases it's accurate, in some cases it isn't. Great attention to detail. Well, I brought with me tonight Sherlock Holmes's magnifying glass. We use that and we go out and we look for detail. So we can't sit high or in our armchair here. We've got to get out and we've got to get down and, and dive like a heron does uh, for the fish, right? We got to get down there and we got to get in amongst the detail on the critical path activities and make sure we help and that's what they're doing now. So you'll see them at meetings, you'll see them reading minutes, and uh, somebody brought up uh, at the meeting a couple meetings ago, maybe it was last meeting, uh, a certain point, and the mayor said, no, that's not a fact. I read the minutes, and I know that's not true. So we got to be very careful about what we say here and make sure we read the minutes and we know what the facts should be. Um, personal involvement. These people are getting personally involved. I've seen the mayor in four or five meetings here in the last couple weeks, and the selectmen uh, uh, from both parties, uh, not all the selectmen, but some of the selectmen from each party, uh, we're in these meetings and uh, I'm very happy to see that because that's how you learn. You go and you read minutes and you go and you talk to people and you get out amongst people. It's uh, can't just wait for people to come to you. You got to go out searching for, for uh, facts, uh, great attention to detail personally, right? And that's what Sherlock Holmes did and that's what we're going to do. Personal attention to detail is also very important. Uh, not just attention to detail, but it has to be personal attention to detail and we, we need to check things out. In a little over a month, these people have only been in, in charge since uh, November 6th. That's about five or six weeks, five, five and a half weeks, I don't know exactly. But uh, um, since then, number one, they've assumed the responsibility of the majority. They didn't shirk any responsibility. They took it right on. Uh, they changed the direction of the town leaders the same way. Uh, from the potential of incurring large debt with a big bond issue to a focus of dramatically increasing the revenue of the town, by adding significantly to the tax base as soon as practical in a responsible manner. They think that's the number of priority. They're involved in that and they're really trying to help us out by personally getting involved in all those activities that they think might bring us this revenue. Um, as I mentioned, they stopped the bond package and um, it was approximately $57 million commitment to the town. Uh, that stopped now. They disbanded the school building committee and established an, a new smaller building committee, five people, uh, with a lot of help from uh, experts around town like uh, uh, people from the uh, 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 
um, different uh, aspects uh, of it. And uh, they already have held two meetings, um, and they are moving on a plan for correcting the civil rights citation and getting it done way beforehand, if possible, for a reasonable amount of money at the Pearson School. They've held two meetings to date. These, uh, this new team of selectmen have negotiated, negotiated the resignation of the town manager and appointed a new acting town manager. Now, I want to make a couple points about that. When I was working uh, in the last four companies or so that I was a very senior uh, executive in, uh, were bought out. Um, you know, Tellerate was bought out by Dow Jones, 9X was bought out by Bell Atlantic, previous companies of mine were bought out by other companies, and whenever that happened, people wanted to bring in their own management, and they wanted to have people that, uh, uh, for one reason or another, they would feel more comfortable in uh, in the job. So, um, no, uh, no, no aspersion on anybody's character or anything. I would go to them and just say, okay, if you have somebody that you would feel more comfortable with, I'd be happy to leave. And usually, of course, I had a contract, so I was uh, paid uh, for the rest of my contract. Now, let me just say something to you. I think about it an awful lot when I look back on my life. I always came out ahead. I never, ever, I always felt bad when I had to leave the company that I thought was doing quite well, but I always ended up with a better job and a more exciting area and a more exciting uh, location and a better uh, compensation package and a lot more responsibility. So I'm wishing uh, uh, these people uh, uh, well that leave and go on and, and uh, to better places. Um, Next, they gave a very strong recommendation, very strong, to planning and zoning to change the approach 180 degrees uh, to the upgrade of the plan of conservation and development to an uh, a new evolutionary one. I'm not going to talk too much about that aspect of it because I'm going to talk a lot about other things tonight there. But uh, last time uh, I talked quite a bit about that. I saw it as a big breakthrough. The newspaper saw it as a big breakthrough. and. Uh, and we think that's, we're tickle pink with that. And uh, they asked them to accept the, the help and suggestions of a major developer to expect, expedite the process. So we need a more evolutionary approach, and you saw Darwin last week. We need that, and we need a major developer to expedite the process. You know, uh, when we talk about this, almost everything you do in life is evolutionary. If you're going to try to build your body, it's evolutionary. It doesn't happen overnight. An education doesn't happen overnight. Learning a musical instrument or even anything about music doesn't happen overnight. Um, growing as a person doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and you can you probably list thousands of things. Now, there are some things that are revolutionary that we must do in a revolutionary manner, like build a new house, but even that turns out to be kind of evolutionary because we always put off as much of it as we can until we can afford it. We might build a house and leave certain rooms empty or rec rooms empty or not build a garage or something like that. So there is a tinge of evolution even when you build a new house. So I want to make that very strong. The next thing they did was they established a Charter Revision Commission that's already established and had its first meeting. The next meeting will be on the 9th of January, where the public is invited in uh, the band room of Pearson School. Everybody's welcome. I encourage everybody to come to that meeting and get your two cents in one way or the other and listen to everybody else's comments uh, on this. In addition, I know I will be. I'm on the commission. I'm going to be out there talking to everybody I can in town and looking for ideas and, and trying to find out what the... Uh, the notion of the town is. I saw in the local Winston paper today where uh, Mr. I think his name is uh, McCarthy, I'm not positive, but he made some comments about it, uh, what he thought about it, but everybody's entitled to their own opinion and now's the time to get your two cents in. Um, the next thing is they appointed people, by the way, the charter thing is going to take quite a while, it's not going to happen overnight. There will be another uh, public uh, hearing uh, when, when a dr first draft of the uh, new charter is, is uh, put together. Um, they appointed officers and they set a sort of a, a schedule for the first meeting at least uh, the other day. Um, they also appointed people with a great deal of development experience to liaise with the major land use commissions. You know, I've talked a lot about that on our, our programs here. That's part of the whole thing. I mean, why appoint somebody to deal with a commission that's never ever done any development? Doesn't make any sense. So now we've got uh, these developers are now interfacing with the major land use commissions. They know a lot about it probably know more about it than most of the commissioners themselves, not all of them, I'm sure some of them are, are just uh, up to speed too, but 
Um, and especially when the commissions are changing people all the time, it helps to have somebody interfacing from the Board of Selectmen who really knows what they're talking about. So I really think uh, in five weeks, these guys have done wonders, and, uh, and, and the one lady that's on the Selectmen, they all did a good job. We've got we're going in the right direction. We're heading down the slope, and uh, I'm, I'm really tickled pink with that. So now, here we go. We're going to put up uh, the next slide, when, uh, which is um, the next point on the agenda, which is dealing with the Enterprise Corridor. That's on the critical path. We're going to be talking a lot about the critical path tonight towards getting uh, our revenue in. And, uh, and as we said last week, uh, getting some uh, papers off to the state for the Army Corps engineers and uh, the, the, the the Department of, of the uh, of the Environment uh, th to get our permission so that we can get on with this uh, with these developments on the hill, that's in our own backyard. We have to make some decisions and we have to get on with it. And we have to give information to the state and, and resolve some uh, problems um, that uh, that are very important. So um, what I'm going to do right now is say that. Uh, a presentation was made this week uh, with my, by Selectman Ham and with some comments by Selectman Capabianca and uh, some comments by the attorney for the developer, Mr. Pearlie Grimes. Remember, they offered some help, free help from the developer to help get this thing uh, moving along faster. So they were there at the meeting. Questions and answers and discussion occurred uh, during the meeting. And uh, there was public uh, comment, which is mostly these people I told you about. No, not many, uh, nobody else made many public comments. But the commission will read the material and discuss at their meeting on December 17th, that's uh, Monday, 2007. My view was it was a good meeting. It was conducted very professionally. Somebody was running around with a camera taping it. But uh, otherwise, I thought it was, uh, that was a bit of a distraction. But otherwise, I thought it was a good meeting and it uh, was professionally conducted didn't last forever, and uh, they had, what they did say was the next time they will uh, bring it up on the agenda right away and they'll discuss it on Monday's meeting. Um, now, Monday meeting is also the selectmen meeting, so I wouldn't expect to see many selectmen at the next meeting, but at least they'll be there and they'll be discussing it. I'll go along to that just so I can report on it fairly. The second thing that happened this week was there was a non-point education uh, meeting. Uh, a nonpoint education for municipal officials meeting called NEMO uh, from the University of Connecticut. Uh, and it, they held a workshop on Tuesday, December 11th, 2007. I popped into that for a little while, but I got the gist of what was going on, so I didn't stay too long. Anything past 6 o'clock at night is past my bedtime. I'm usually up at 1 or 2 in the morning working on the pre this show stuff when it's nice and quiet. Uh, so I get to bed kind of early. But anyway, I stayed up past my bedtime, and I went down there. And a presentation was made that was strongly, that strongly cons con uh, confirmed the evolutionary approach that we discussed last time, and that was recommended by the selectmen to P and Z. Um, and they, they, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't have been stronger on that whole thing. And their basic idea was, hey, let's not wait to do a big bang approach. Now let's not sit in our armchair. Let's get out and let's get an evolutionary approach going. It's better for everybody. I happen to always agree with that. Most businessmen do. Not many people want to sit around for a long time, cost a lot of money, and then find out later that, hey, wait a minute, we didn't think of everything. And you know, you can sit here now, no matter how much you try to plan, you won't think of everything. It isn't until you get out in the bushes that you begin to find out what's really happening and what you need to do. So we need to evolve that. A handout was available. I do have uh, a copy of that handout if anybody wants a copy or you can get one from the, uh, the people down at the Planning and Zoning Department. It was a very, very good presentation. The mayor and at least three selectmen were present as well as members of the various land use boards. The meeting was very professional and positive during a portion that I attended. The P and Z meetings and agendas are available and I'll put this up on the uh, chart for you so you can see, but I'll read it off as well. The P and Z meeting minutes and agendas are available on the Town of Winchester website. You can also get other things there too when you get on there you'll see. Uh, once, uh, once they're ready for distribution. They don't have to wait to be approved, they just have to be ready for distribution. They go on the website. So if you go to the townofwinchester.org, you click on government, you click on meeting minutes and agendas, and then you select the P and Z minutes uh, or agenda for the next meeting, if it's there, and uh, or any of the other, like in the wetland meetings or any of the other me meetings that are posted, you can get on there. 
and I think it's a real good thing. So if you want any information, read the minutes of this thing. You should read the, as I'll show you tonight, you should read those meetings every, every uh, two weeks or whatever, uh, whenever there's a meeting, so you can see exactly what's happening, and you can get the facts, and you can get down to the detail, and you don't have to rely on other people. The person who takes the meetings is wonderful. She does a best job on minutes I've seen in a long time. Not to disparage anybody else who also does a good job, but she really does a good job, and they're a pleasure to read. So it's not a drudgery to read these minutes. It's a pleasure to read them. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is moving forward. Okay, And what do we need to do to move forward here? Because we're on the critical path. Uh, moving forward, we, we need to drop down to the detail. We need to get out our magnifying glass and get to know all the detail and get down there and then uh, when we come back to the top again, we can make intelligent decisions. So we drop down to the detail. We define the critical path of the activities with time scales of each that are necessary to get the major permits from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of the Environment and to be into the ground, as the developers like to say. When are they going to be into the ground digging holes to put in the water and sewer and building the roads and things? And We'd like to be into the ground by May 1st of 2008 because that's, you know, you got to get going. And the quicker we get going, the better off we're going to be. I'll show you a timeline of that later. Um, we need, number two, we need to manage the process with a sense of urgency. There's that word again, sense of urgency. And the dedication, dedication needed to achieve the end date. It's not going to come about by wishy-washy. Everybody's got to be dedicated. We all got to be pulling for it. And uh, it's like going to the moon, we all got to help. And if there's anybody that isn't helping, then we've got to find them another activity that's not on the critical path because we need everybody helping here. Um, suggestions on what needs to be done to accomplish this project. I'm going to give you a few suggestions. These are Brian's suggestions. Um, you know, they might not do this. Uh, there are other ways you can do it. Uh, I'm sure they'll have to take some of this uh, advice. If not, uh, that's okay. It's up to them. Number one, you have to define the activities necessary and make them very visible to everybody. And then you have to show them what the critical path, and I'm going to do that tonight, an example, not the final, but what a critical path of the plan is. And that has to be done. Um, the second thing that has to be done is you have to assign dates. And you usually do that when you're planning these types of things, you usually assign the dates from the, the, from the end date backwards. You don't start in the beginning and define dates. You say, what is our objective? What is our goal? And you put that date down. As I just said, that's May 1st of 2008 for planning purposes. Might not end up there, might not be the final date. But if it pushes into next winter, then that slows the whole thing down again. So they want to get moving and move as fast as possible. So. Um, uh, that's okay so the dates we need to assign I'll show you an example in a few minutes the next thing we need to do is ask the developer and other organizations for free assistance and help there was a lot of talk at the meeting the other night about how busy people are and their volunteers and why we didn't do this before and we couldn't get the money all kinds of reasons okay I've heard those reasons all over the world from all kinds all different people and languages and everything else and uh, uh, well, here's how you normally approach it. You ask a developer and other organizations for free assistance and help. And you accept help that has already been offered, which uh, I hope they do. I'm going to talk more, I hope, uh, if we don't run out of time, more about that number three, because I got some specific examples there. The next thing, number four, is ask political parties, the Taxpayers Association, and the public to lobby their state representatives and other connections to help expedite the process at the state level. We can work on our on our activities and we can muster resources but what's harder when you get up to the state or in federal government then you got to lobby you got to get in there with the best of your representatives and your town management and you got to say we need an answer we're going to give you the thing on x date we want an answer by y date and then i when i was in california trying to make payrolls i used to put people on an airplane with flowers and candy send them to washington dc and say don't come back without the check because we got a payroll to meet on Friday. And that's the kind of thing we have to do. Um, and, uh, and give them the air cover, get, get in there at the state level and the federal level and find out, speed up things at that level, which is a tough task. Number four, 
ask political, oh, I'm sorry, number, uh, I got the numbers wrong here, but number five is appoint one person in the PNZ commission. I got a little slide later if I can get to it about how to speed up a lot of these commission things and get them done, but appoint one person on the PNZ commission, preferably someone that can devote the time, a retired person or somebody that, that can devote the time, maybe somebody who's got time off in the summer or, or things like that, uh, to be responsible for this activity until PNZ is off the critical path, right? So that's the way I would approach it. Uh, I would find somebody who could spend the time, and I'd say, you get in there, you make sure everything gets done, and then help us so we don't have to do it all at the meetings. Do it between meetings, and, uh, and um, we'll give you decisions from meeting to meeting if we have to, and if you need one quicker, get us all on the phone, and we'll do a telephone meeting and give you the permission to move forward or answer your questions. So um, that is very important. Um, the next uh, thing I want to say is, and I kind of skipped over it before, was we need to overlap activities wherever possible in our planning so that uh, we can, um, you know, we can do things in parallel. And I, that's one of my expediting the solution things is to, you know, do things in parallel wherever you can. So um, we need to overlap activities wherever, wherever possible and, uh, and, and try to do our best to do that, get many people working in parallel. We talked about that as one of our techniques. Here, here I'm showing you all these techniques we've been talking about are beginning to be applied here for the town's business if people take me up on my suggestions. And then speed up the decision making and approval process with P&Z, the Army Corps of Engineers, DEP, the state, the town, and the development people. They're all involved. They've all got a stake in this. We call them stakeholders in business. They all want to make it happen and they should be meeting uh, uh, which they are to a great extent. I'm not trying to say they're not, they're, but we just we got to help them, and we got to remove any obstacles that we can uh, to make sure they can get their job done. Now, suggestions from Brian on how to uh, proceed. Again, these are my suggestions: hold special meetings, draft helpers from the ranks of other commissions, say economic development, for example, and the public. Ask the developers and other organizations. Um, Ask the developers and other organizations to help you out. Um, take help wherever you can get it. And don't be um, bashful about that. Um, that that's very important uh, that you do that. Uh, so that's kind of what I had on that. I don't think I have any more on, on how to proceed, but uh, we talked a bit about it. So uh, and I might even talk a little bit more about it later. But anyway, the next thing I want to talk about, and the real meat here, it's sort of halfway through the show, so I want to get into this. I'm going to put together for you, I worked with Mr. Selectman, Mike Ham, and uh, we spent a lot of time on this this week. Most of this are his, is his ideas. I just helped get it down on a piece of paper so I could explain it to everybody. And I can tell you right now, it's not the exact critical path. This is just a sample to show you how these things are usually done and how this can be done. And I'm sure that tomorrow, when everybody looks over what I've done here, they'll find other things that aren't on here, things that can't be done in the time frames I suggest, all that kind of thing. But uh, that all can be fixed. But this, is, again, is getting it going. Let's get it evolving. Then the way, first thing you got to do is you got to have an embryo. Well, this is the embryo for the plan. And it's, I call it critical activities. The first critical activity is planning and zoning to update the current plan for conservation and development. Uh, and they call that the POCD. Uh, uh, consider, uh, considering the, the suggested changes recommended by the developer and it handed over to the selectmen before January 1, 2008. The sooner the better. Now they might decide for some reason not to do that, but that's something political that I can't get involved in or town business that I can't get involved in, but, but by January 1, we have to have that handed over or we're not going to make uh, this plan for May 1st. So now the second thing that has to happen is the selectmen need to hold special meeting once they get it on, on January 1st. They need to uh, hold a special meeting and review and comment on the updated version of the POCD and pass it back to P&Z by January 5th. That's not much time. They'll have to have a special meeting or a phone meeting and they'll have to go over it and decide what they want to hand back, give comments to P&Z or not, whatever, okay? And then um, they will hand it back to P&Z on January 5th and then P&Z will incorporate any changes recommended by the selectmen and schedule a public hearing, they have to do this by charter, 
from public hearing, incorporating changes, and pass that back to the selectmen with comments, et cetera, by January 20th. And they would go to have a public hearing, incorporate what they think is, is valuable and what they need, and then they'll pass it on to the selectmen. We need to do that by January 20th on the critical path. If we don't, we're not going to make May unless we find some way ahead of that, after that, to catch up on the time we will lose. We never like to get behind on critical path because it's very difficult to catch up, if not uh, impossible. Next, the selectmen, when they receive it on January 20th, uh, according to my uh, uh, rough estimate here, uh, selectmen uh, will hold a special meeting again, or a phone meeting or whatever, to approve and send a letter of approval to the Office of Policy Management. Uh, and uh, that's now we're getting up into the state and federal type responsibilities. I don't know exactly where that is, but it's probably the state. But uh, by January 24th, so they, they only have four days there, and it's right around uh, uh, you know a critical time there. Maybe a big snow day there, but one way or another, they got to get it done. So they can have a meeting by email, by phone, in person, whatever they have to do to get that done. And then the OPM, this is out of our hands. That's why I say we need the air cover from all our representatives and anybody else we can get it from. Uh, they need to respond to the selectmen by January 7th. Now, I could give you a lot of examples of where I've done this in the past, including contacting the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, on one, in one situation to help get me some air cover and a uh, thing we were doing at the University of Kansas. But I don't have time right now, and maybe I can do that in future meetings. But wh what you got to do is get out there and get it done. Find people that can help you and work the system. And uh, if all seven selectmen have to go down there to the OPM and talk to people and bring the representatives along, whatever it takes, that's results orientation. They don't want to sit around giving us all the excuses and reasons why they didn't make it. Uh, they want to make it. Okay, the next one is, uh, when that happens, I'm saying the OPM, th we gave them uh, two weeks for the OPM to respond to the selectmen. It might take three months. I don't know what it'll take. But we better get down there and try to get back in two weeks so we can make our schedule. Selectmen then send an application for an extension to the DEP through the OPM by February 10th. And this is the best I understand it. Tomorrow somebody will say, hey, there's another step there, or you got that wrong, Brian, it really goes somewhere else. That's okay. I'm just trying to get across an idea here. That's all. This is an example. And uh, my view would be tomorrow if we get a change, we'll change this, and then we'll make it as accurate as we can as soon as we can because we need to deal with facts. The next thing is uh, by February 10th we hope to have uh, – uh, that application for extension sent to the DEP. Uh, I'm not quite sure when we send that, w what we can do here, but, what, uh, but we'll find out. And then the developer says that he wants two months, once he gets all his approvals, uh, he wants two months to be able to get ready to go into the ground. So that's April 10th. So right now, we got a little slack here. We're trying to go for May 1st, and it looks like we may be able to do it, if with a lot of luck, by April 10th. That gives us a little room there in case we slip a little bit. We still got some space. I'll show you that on my plan. Now, um, uh, the next point I want to say is there are some other activities besides the critical path activities that we have to take into consideration. And I say for better, they're non-critical path activities that are very important. And uh, I say for lack of a better word right now that these necessary activities are things that need to get done in order to make, and they could become on the critical path if we're not careful, so we want to make sure they don't. And the first thing we need is, uh, I need to say is that uh, the, uh, we need the developer in the town to finalize the plans with the state concerning the water supply down the enterprise corridor to the state and develop property. That's already happening. I went to the last meeting. It was very positive, and they're going to come up with three letters, and they're going to try to resolve the problem. So that's, that's moving along fine with Public Works um, and uh, the Sewer and Water Commission and the developer. The next is the town and developer need to finalize the sewer plan and uh, down the Enterprise Corridor to the developer's property, and that's one of the things that's... Uh, 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 we talked about the critical path. We need to get that critical path done so that we can f do this number two. But the town and the developer need to make up their own sub plan on how they're actually going to do it here once the state approves. That's what that's all about. The next one is planning and zoning to review and approve Winchester Estates. Uh, they recently submitted it, came up at uh, 
uh, is going to come up at, I think, their some meeting in January because it has to be a special permit, and a special permit requires public hearings and things like that. So uh, the first meeting on that plan, you can get all the information, by the way, if you want, down, you can go down and get it from the town hall. I won't bring a big truck with you because there's a lot of drawings and a lot of paper, but there is a little summary there that you perhaps can get if you are interested in it. And I went down, and I got some of the paperwork, but not all of it. So that needs to get through. And um, this is the second time. It was turned down once. It was denied. They have changed the plan, and it's in for approval, and they're going to go through that process. So I'll show you that on the plan. Then the Inland Wetlands uh, needs to approve the Winchester Estate changes to the previously approved, approved plan without uh, public hearings. Now, if you remember in the past, I tell you that Inland Wetlands has already uh, approved this plan. But since the developer is making some changes to satisfy P and Z because they're denied there, it has to go back through in the wetlands again. And uh, they had a meeting the other night where these guys were last on the agenda. I think it came up around 11 o'clock at night or something. I'll talk about that separately if we get time. But uh, the Inland Wetlands uh, uh, has decided, I saw in the paper at least, uh, I don't sit through all their meetings. They go too long past my bedtime. And um, they should be done in an hour, and it takes them four or five hours ever to get through things. But uh, the Inland Wetlands uh, did say they would probably be able to uh, consider this without having public hearings and uh, big reviews and all that kind of thing. So some work will have to be done there. But I think we always expected that this would be the least of our problems uh, on this. And when I say we, I mean uh, uh, we the town trying to get the development in. Not we the developers. I have nothing to do with the developers. Now I'm going to show you a critical path. I'm hoping the guys that are handling the slides will be able to focus in on this. I did a big copy. A friend of mine saw a rough idea of what I was doing last week and said, you ought to make a red line on the critical path. So I've made it. And uh, do you think you can focus this in for them? Let me know when you get it, and I'll start explaining it to them. Okay, I think you're going to see it right now. You did a good job with that real quick, and I'm happy with that. Okay, this is an example of a CPM, critical path method. It's been around for a long, long time. One of the other techniques people used to use was uh, uh, PERT, which was a, like a program evaluation thing. But CPM um, is a computer package. I don't use it uh, much any by computer, but for our kind of projects, you don't need a computer. But basically, here it is. This is the critical path. And here's a timeline down here, January, February, March, and April. And here's all our activities I just talked about in here. Uh, this is all the activities along the critical path that we need to do to get the corridor thing done. And uh, actually, I left it red there. But it probably a red will stop once we get all our approvals. Right about here, the red should stop. So I think I made a mistake there putting that red in. So up to here, it'll be red. And then it may or may not be red here. It depends on what happens over here. So what do we got? We've got all P and Z needs to do their first thing that I told you about, and then the select me to hold their, their uh, special meeting or whatever. If it happens to fall on the night of one of their regular meetings, they can do it then. Uh, P and Z again gets it back, and they have the public meeting, public hearing. I always want to say meeting. It's a hearing. And then the selectmen have to do their little thing again, and then the, uh, then the letter goes off to the DEP. And then when they approve it two weeks later or whatever, then the developer gets on with his long piece. He may, we may, we want to try to talk him into coming in closer if we can too, so we can get this done quicker. And then you got all the slack up here that if he should make it by April uh, 10th, we got some 20 days there in case some of this doesn't make it on time. Now, what do we got here? We got in, Inlands Wetlands to do their little thing they got to do with the, uh, the, the new Winchester Estates uh, application that they've got. And uh, that needs to be done here before the developer uh, is finished, because he needs his permit there to get started. The water down the corridor, that's being worked on quite successfully. That'll come in here. Uh, this has uh, got a few complications with it, but nothing that uh, they, they don't understand and won't do. And then there's the corridor itself, all those things. Then there's the sewer. We need to be able to have the plans with the town. Uh, and, uh, and the developer, how we're going to put the sewer in, and uh, what size the pipe is going to be, and uh, you know how it, you know all the technic. There's a plan for that. Now, let me just say to you. Uh, first, I'll finish this, and then we've got Winchester Estates, which is in P and Z now, and they're going to hold their first meeting on that on January 
something, seventh or ninth, it's like I can never remember the exact dates, but somewhere up there, or maybe even later than that. Whenever they have to, uh, there's certain rules about when you have public hearings. You've got to, so many days in the newspaper, so many days, uh, then you've got to have the meetings 70 days before that, so uh, after that. So uh, that I don't know the exact date on, but it's somewhere up in the mid to end of January. Uh, and then uh, that may or may not get approved. This may or may not get approved. If not, then we slip out on here. Uh, they come back in with new things, and it, you know that could go on forever. So we want to try to get uh, things approved with conditions wherever we can. And I'm going to talk to you uh, hopefully in a few minutes about how we can do that a little little better. Okay, so that's what it is. Now, when this slips, it stays red. It stays red until we get get all our permits. Then the developer will have to slip his hopefully not farther than this slack. But if this thing slips six months, this is going to slip six months, right? So it's very important. Now, I'm going to turn this around because I'm using it for the backdrop of my slides. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to just say a, a little bit about the benefit of the approach. And the benefit of the approach is uh, that this will force out the inevitable um, problems. Uh, oh, you got to focus it again, huh? OK. <laughs> All right. Okay, this will force out the inevitable problems into the open in time to fix them before we slip. The whole game here, and it is a bit of a game, is to make sure we don't slip. And uh, we have to do all kinds of things to make sure we don't slip. And uh, what I used to do when I ran big programs, I'd go out and get pizzas for people and beer, keep them working, trying to encourage them to work nights and weekends and everything I could to, to, make, to keep on schedule. So a lot of things have to happen here, uh, and we, uh, we got to keep doing that. Next, once the critical path and other activities are planned, we, we must always be on the lookout for potential slippage. Remember I told you in the techniques that visibility is very important and attention to detail is very important. And we must always be on the lookout for potential slippage and take action in time to stop it from occurring. Doesn't do any good after you slip. You got to stop. We're in intensive care. We've got to stop things before the patient dies, not after. It doesn't help any if that happens. So we got to be on the lookout. We got to have the monitors on. We got to have the monitor. We got to be watching it all the time. So I'll be watching on this program every week and keeping you up to date as best I can get the details from the town. Uh, plenty of problems will happen. We know that. That's the approach. Evolution brings a lot of problems. There will be a lot of problems. There will be a lot of problems with revolution, too. Problem is you find them out too late. Here we're going to find them out quick enough. That's a reason for evolution. So you can force the problems out, recognize them if you're looking for them, and then fix them fast. That's the important thing. And if you're going off track and you find out your plan isn't exactly what you thought it should be, then you change your plan. It's that simple. Okay, the next, uh, the approach will also help uh, to speed up non-critical activities. So it's just as important, you know, to watch for the non-critical activities and uh, make sure they don't become critical activities. So uh, you don't want the patient in intensive care to develop pneumonia, for example, or some other heart problem or some problem with his uh, lungs. So you got to be on the lookout for all that while you're trying to fix the problem that he's got. So, or she's got, whoever. Okay, so that's very important. And, uh, and, uh, I could talk for a week about all this stuff, but we don't have a week. So um, the uh, activity to increase the probability that action will be taken before they become critical. So when the patient's in the critical room, then we watch for everything. And if we think it looks like the lungs are filling with water, we take some action and we do something about it to stop that. Okay, so that's important. And all the nurses have to be very diligent, very diligent, and so do the doctors. Okay. Once the town is off the critical path, once we're off the critical path and developers on the critical path, um, we want to say, hey, we want to stay off the critical path. You know, we, we want to make sure we, 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 we get rid of all obstacles for the developer. So in a responsible way, of course, so that uh, he can, won't have us to use as an excuse for slippage. Whenever you have one of these things that's tightly monitored, then everybody has an wants to find an excuse for slippage instead of trying to find a way to get the things done. So you got to keep, we call that in business, peeling the layers of the onion, you know? So you got to keep peeling the layers of the onion, and you got to eliminate excuses. Eliminate excuses, eliminate excuses. More excuses will come up than good ideas, I'll guarantee you on that. So we should be very diligent and strive to stay ahead of the game and not end up on the critical path ourselves. Now it's inevitable that we will sometimes, but as soon as we do, red flag goes up and uh, we all move in the intensive care to get, get off the critical path again.
Okay. So now I would like to think I have about 10 minutes left. If you guys know how much time I've got, put up a little signal. But I'm going to now say help. Um, okay, I got a little time. Good. I'm going to get into what I wanted to talk about. Help. We need help. Everybody needs help. And uh, we're, you know, we're not uh, ones to turn down help. We want help. So anybody who wants to give us help, providing it's uh, going in the right direction and doesn't put us in jail or something, we want to accept help. And we want to do, as I told you once, the absolute value of everything. Uh, I showed you the absolute value mathematical symbol. And I told you that that's very important for we businessmen. So what I'm saying is we've got a lot of people in this community who could help us. And uh, what I'm trying to say is, hey, let's ask them for help. Uh, John Grappo, he's still in the community. Everybody speaks very highly of John Grappo. A phone call to him once in a while, or if John Grappo can help us in any way with state officials and representatives and or even mentor some of the younger people here. I think John's in his 80s. I don't know him personally, but boy, he has a great reputation. Ann Harding, I think she's in her late 90s, but still very, uh, very um, um, with it, so to speak, and she can be a big help to us. Uh, so if she can help us, uh, that would be great. Uh, we should ask her for help. And if Jan, if you're out there listening, please volunteer your help, you know, if you haven't already, and give us some advice. I've talked to Nancy Eisenhower many times. She now lives in Litchfield. Wonderful. And uh, she could probably give us a lot of advice. She was mayor here, and uh, she knows the town very well, and she can help mentor people and help us maybe through the state. I don't know. George Wilbur we know. Uh, Andrew Rohrbach we know. And then maybe there's other people. Uh, you people know more than I do, but any way we can get help, please, let's get some help. And, uh, and anybody in town who thinks they can help should volunteer their services. And uh, heaven knows everybody needs help. P&Z might need somebody to help them with things from between meetings. Uh, please volunteer if you can. Please share your experience and wisdom by mentoring the less experienced members of the minority party especially. Let's all pull together to help the town resolve its financial difficulties and rebuild. And I'm thanking you in advance for that because I know you will do it. And that's what I'm doing here. It takes me about 60 hours every week to prepare this. I'm up all night because that's when I think best. My mind's clear. And uh, if I get meetings, um, uh, things in my head for these meetings, I can't sleep. So I get up and I, and I do the work. And uh, that's what a lot of people are doing. All these volunteers that are in town are doing their best. I would not, qual I would not question that. But um, if we can help them, and make their job easier. Uh, when I do go to meetings, I hear a lot about how they're volunteers and they don't have enough time and some of them have to get up early in the morning and all. So any help they can get would be appreciated. And uh, I'm asking you to do that. Now, I want to talk a bit about meetings tonight and I'm talking generically about meetings. Oh, I think they, uh, if I said in the past, the Inland Wetland meeting I think is, is a, my example of probably need of most help. So. Uh, I don't even go to their meetings anymore, as I said earlier, because I just can't take it. It's too much for me. So I'm going to put up this thing called efficient meetings. And uh, as far as efficiency is concerned in meetings, I'm going to give you some ideas on how you can be more efficient. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to pay any attention. And in the past, nobody did anyway. But I've just got to keep going because we've got new people involved now. And I'm hoping that these new people can help us to recognize these things. And I don't think these will be strange to the people who are in business uh, and who are used to running efficient meetings. And we do have several very efficient meetings run in this town. And I wouldn't want to say we don't. So I'm not trying to concentrate on those. I'm trying to concentrate on that aren't inefficient, especially if they're on our critical path. So in uh, planning zoning, I've always thought was pretty efficiently run meeting. Uh, it could be improved like everything else. So here we go. Number one, set a time limit for a meeting, usually one hour or so. Set a time limit. It doesn't have to be an hour. It could be an hour and a half. Sometimes it's going to be two hours because you'll have a special thing. But in general, it should be an hour. If you don't set the time limit, just like a critical path, you're not going to make it. All right? The next is have various party experts meet between meetings and to resolve differences. You don't have to do it in the meeting. Meet between meetings. Talk between meetings. Get on the phone. Instead of going to the newspapers, talk to your counterparts and, uh, and uh, talk so that these critical things don't just come up in a meeting, because that delays the meeting. We talk about a lot of things that aren't even on the policy list, and especially in the lower meetings. They waste a lot of time in those lower meetings talking about things that aren't even, they shouldn't even be talking about. The next thing is uh, a short report uh, 
should be prepared for pre-meeting ready by the commissioners. So if people talk between the meetings, they should prepare a short little half page and they should say that uh, here we are, we talked about this and uh, we want to keep you abreast of it or we need a decision from you or whatever. Next, a list of decisions that you need from any, any uh, commission. A list of decisions should, could be prepared that you come up with between the meetings. We need this. Now, that should be zero. Because if you take and you get all the people from uh, all the expertise together in these meetings, like for example, if you've got the developers coming in, you get your own consultant, the town's consultant, to meet with the developer's consultant, and if there's any special consultants needed for specific things, they should meet, and they should resolve the problems between meetings. And then they should come to you and say, we resolve most of them, and we agree, and uh, we have a couple more to go, or we need to present you with this one because you need to be involved in this decision. So that's all done outside the meetings. Presently now, that's all done inside the meetings, right? So um, from the, uh, that's the way it should be. Most of this stuff, presentations and all, shouldn't be done in the meeting. It should be bottom line. And uh, in business, we have a thing called, give me the bottom line. Tell me the bottom line. What's the bottom line? We got other things to get on with here. We trust you experts. We want you to work together outside the meetings and tell us uh, your opinions. That's why we hired you. The next is, um, the town, uh, by the way, all that information that these people come up with should be distributed prior to the meeting to the commissioners so they can read it, or the selectmen, they can read it, and uh, they'll be up to date when they come to the meeting and don't have to hear it all over again. And they can boil it down to essential questions and speed the meeting up. The next is the town representative can and should attend these meetings. And a lot more, 95% of the time, the town manager, re the town representatives, like the guy who coordinates the Inland Wellens or the guy who coordinates uh, uh, the uh, planning and zoning, they should be in these meetings with these experts and they should know what's going on. Um, now I've got to go speed up, I've only got three minutes to go and i got a lot more here so I'll probably have to do it again next some other time, but list of rules and uh, delegates, I'll put it up here, you can read it quicker than I can speak it, but uh, list the rules and delegates to the town representative 90% of the time. If you give him the rules, he can do most of his work between meetings and report. The representative can then send a report to the commissioners to read before the meeting. The meetings uh, can be held by phone call or rarely during the meeting. Any questions can be answered before, before the meeting by uh, people. If a rubber stamping is necessary for charter reasons or something, then uh, it can be done at the meeting and should take a little time. Uh, grandstanding should not be allowed at meetings. I, like, I see a lot of people in meetings trying to show you how much they know about things when they don't know anything at all, so, or very little, so, um, and that's very apparent usually when they talk about these things. So let's not allow, the uh, chairman shouldn't allow any grandstanding. That should be kept to a minimum. We don't care about the past and why somebody didn't do this 10 years ago or five years ago. That doesn't help us move forward. The next is to choose a chairman that has to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning. If you choose a chairman that has to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning, that might help you uh, to go to work. That will help keep the meeting short. I'll guarantee you on that. If something needs to be placed in the record, have it done in writing form with a brief, Bre as brief as the law allows, uh, and a summary given to the meeting only if necessary. The smaller the commission, the briefer the meeting. At, at uh, other suggestions are followed, if, if the other suggestions are followed. That's Brian's rule. You might agree with, not agree with that, but I think smaller meetings and smaller commissions is better because then you don't have to listen to everybody talk about a little, little things. And then if attorney's advice is needed, have the town representative get outside the meeting, talk to the legal lawyers, and then present it in writing to the committee so they don't have to sit and listen to the lawyer. And with that, I'm out of time now. It's been a great meeting. We're really moving as a town tickle pink with the way we're going. It looks like we're going to get off this critical path hopefully in the next few months and we're going to get on with it and we're going to see the light of the day. And as the railroad guys used to say, I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. See you next week.
We're making more progress now, yes, dear. We're making more progress now, yes, dear. We're making more progress now. Still have a long way to go. They promised to bring us more revenue and quality. Promised to bring us more revenue and quality. Promised to bring us more revenue and quality. Instead is now. Hello everybody, this is Brian O'Haran back again with Planning for Progress, uh, Planning for Success actually, or Progress, either one. Um, happy to be here. Uh, today I have a, kind of a special introduction to the program. I want to talk about uh, how entrepreneurial businessmen think. I have many reasons for that, which I'll explain in a minute. But first, I want to introduce my guest today. Uh, on the wall, you should see a picture of my old friend, uh, classmate Charlie Tidwell, the world champion sprinter. Um, he had f held four world records in the 100 yard dash, 220, was a 220 uh, yard hurdler, um, and uh, he was on all the relay teams. And at the time that I knew him, he was the fastest man in the world before Bob Hayes. Um, God rest your soul, Charlie. Charlie's no longer with us. But uh, I knew him when I was at Kansas. He was on the Kansas. Uh, team and he was an excellent uh, sprinter, the best in the world. I have them there for a very good reason today because I want to talk about one of the things that Charlie taught me when I knew him. Charlie said that you need to get off the blocks fast and run like heck until you reach the finish line. That's one of the things that the entrepreneurs are doing in our town now. thought it quite appropriate that Charlie be with us for a little while today. Um, because our people are getting off the blocks fast and they're going to run like heck until they get to the finish line. We will get the revenue into town eventually. It'll take quite a while, but we will get there. This isn't going to be a 100-yard dash. It's going to be more like the 10,000-meter uh, run that I tell you that uh, Billy Mills won in the Olympics. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to get moving. The, after that, you'll see another picture, the old uh, picture I used once before, but all the original entrepreneurs that built this town and uh, also had to get off the blocks fast and, and run uh, rapidly. So um, as I watch the selectmen meetings now, I see um, and predicted in my past shows way back in the earlier days that the stratification between the businessmen 
and the non-business people at the selectmen meeting. It was very obvious in the last selectmen meeting, and uh, there's a reason for that. Um, that's why I was pushing uh, all along on my shows for all businessmen to run our business when the election happened. Now, we didn't get all businessmen. We got five businessmen. We got one educator, and, and we have one other person who is, uh, I don't know whether will be a businessman or not, but uh, we'll see. Time will tell uh, there. He's off to a good start, but um, I don't really know um, if he can keep up with these five businessmen. Time will tell that. Um, for one reason or another, we didn't get the seven businessmen. I'm still hoping we do next time around in two years when we have another election because I think it's very important. Seeing the frustration of the minority at the meetings, I decided to write this next few slides for the, this program. This is an attempt to help others in town understand that this will not be cured overnight, this frustration, if ever. But we must move on because there are many decisions that the non-businessmen may not be qualified to understand and may not be able to contribute to in a timely and meaningful way. And we see a little bit of that now in the frustration. Hence the them and us feeling that we, we um, get feedback from around town. Why is there a them and us feeling here? Why, why are the businessmen so strong? And why aren't the other people included more in a lot of the decision making? I hope what I'm going to say today helps. Successful entrepreneurial businessmen, and what you see here with these five businessmen, is you see, uh, at least among most of them, you see survival of the fittest. That's our friend Darwin again. These are people who made it. They're the best. Not everybody makes it. It's a very, very high dropout rate when people start small businesses and uh, entrepreneurs start businesses. It's up in a 90% or so of businesses that start in America don't succeed. These people have succeed and they are successful entrepreneurial businessmen. And successful entrepreneurial businessmen know, like Charlie did, that you have to get started fast and run like heck until you reach your goal. If you don't do that, you might not succeed and you might not stay in business. So it's very important. So successful entrepreneurs, and ours are all successful, do not think like most normal organizational experienced people. They don't, like, they don't think like people who are brought up in bureaucracies. They don't think like people who are brought up in large organizations that run by a different set of rules and procedures. Um, and uh, they don't really want to get caught in that trap. What they want to do is recreate the approach that made them successful and that they know and that they know works. Businessmen are more likely to size up a job requirement, for example, say the town manager or any other job, quickly, and then approach other successful people that they know and try to convince them to join their organization or recommend or for them to recommend someone else that they know and trust for their job. If necessary or to be a subcontractor, right? So that's how they do it. They don't run uh, to the newspapers or to search organizations or they don't plan a big, uh, a big uh, process. What they do is they go and they ask people and they, they try to they rely on people they know and that they know the experience and they have probably worked with before and then they will try to attract that person. They often have to employ them for short periods of time seasonal or by the job even. So they are willing to remunerate them when necessary more than say the going rate. You're always careful of course to watch their costs because that's they need to break even at least to, to keep alive. But um, they're willing to do what they have to do, what's necessary to attract and keep good people. And they will always go out of their way when they have a good person to keep that person and to incent the person and to create the environment where the person can be successful. Um, they also have to encourage them to take difficult jobs or encourage them to devote more time and take more risk. 
This is, goes on every day in their businesses. And um, sometimes they have to not keep people. If the people aren't performing or aren't comfortable and aren't helping out, then um, they can't stay. If this approach does not bear fruit, then they will network. We call it networking in business. What you do is you start spreading the word everywhere, that, uh, the type of person you're looking for, and you try to rely on personal mo references more than anything else. Um, and you do that from professional to professional in an attempt to find an exceptional person. For all sorts of reasons, the last thing that they want to do is advertise, use the internet. A lot of these people don't use the internet at all for many things. Um, it is a good tool, we know that. And in some professions, especially in large bureaucracies and organizations, it's absolutely essential. But in a lot of businesses, entrepreneurial business, not necessary at all. So you don't necessarily have to, to be that literate on a computer in many types of businesses. You certainly don't want to employ a search firm unless you have to. That's a long, drawn out. And that's usually done for a real exceptional uh, type at the top of large companies or places where you really want some exceptional uh, criteria that uh, you can't get through networking very easily. And search firms take years sometimes to find the right people for the right job. Successful entrepreneurs are good judges of people, very good judges of people. They have honed their skills to be able to do that. The unsuccessful ones are the 90% or so that aren't in business anymore. They didn't develop these skills. Um, and they're willing to take a certain amount of risk when they employ people. We know now that when we employ our new town manager, there will be risk involved. He may not have a job or she may not have a job uh, for, for much longer than a, a few months. Then again, they may. So we, uh, there is risk involved, and whoever does apply uh, must understand that, and all the cards must be on the table. But these entrepreneurs are used to working that way, so it's not a big problem for them. They're usually pretty good at sizing up people. Uh, that's one of the th skills that they develop over the years and have developed. These types of entrepreneurial business managers are usually result-oriented. They have to be. And they're used to financing things with their own money. That's very important. That doesn't happen in big bureaucracies. That doesn't happen in organizations where you, you might be where the number one union in the country is uh, involved. These people put up their own money or money that, of other people that are their investors and they have to be very diligent with the use of that money. They're used to financing things with their own money or are entrusted with other people's money, so they learn to judge quality. They have to learn to judge quality, experience, and progress fast. They know that quality and time is money. If they make a mistake, which they often do, everybody makes a lot of mistakes. I once talked about how Ted Williams only batted 444 or so. They know they're going to make mistakes because they're moving fast. They need to move fast like Charlie says, you got to run. And they're quick to rectify any situation because they'll set up a, a, a mechanism for finding out what the problems are and then fixing them. Um, that's the visibility they employ and the willingness to listen and uh, correct themselves. And they've already shown some examples of that. They're not perfect. They've gotten some feedback from people and from other selectmen, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, uh, they are showing signs of being able to, to, to um, absorb that and change. As I said before on previous programs, businessmen do not like surprises. They don't want any surprises. They want to know everything. We had an example of a surprise this week where the uh, people from the uh, um, uh, parts of town here um, didn't have a contract since last June. They were working without a contract since last June, and it wasn't that well known at the selectman level, at least uh, to the new selectman. Once they found out about it, they took immediate action. It'll take a while to resolve the problems, I'm sure, but, that, uh, but it will be done. It'll be done rapidly, and, uh, and decisions will be made. 
They like visibility. Entrepreneurs love visibility because that's how they find out what's going on and that's how they change uh, their decision making when they find out that when things are going right, that's great. If they're not, they got to fix it. If they don't fix it, then they're out of business. It's their time and money. They want to deal with facts, as I said last week. Facts are very important. They need facts, not supposition. So you must understand that when you deal with these businessmen or when you see them in the selectmen meeting, they must have the facts. They're not very happy when they find out things are not factual. Not saying they don't make the odd mistake with the facts themselves or even myself. Well, everybody is human. We all make mistakes. And that's why I always say on this program, if you find out I'm making a mistake or I said the wrong thing, um, then correct me. Uh, through the email or through the post office box, and then I'll come on the program and fix it. Uh, people often say to me, Brian, you admit your mistakes on there. They, everybody thinks you're making mistakes all the time. I say, well, I'm going pretty fast here. Spend a lot of time every week preparing for this, and uh, I do make mistakes, but I do try to uh, correct them when I'm wrong. Often, when a businessman makes a mistake, if he doesn't have the visibility, and he doesn't t make a decision, he doesn't correct it, it's very costly, and, and uh, they often pay dearly for their mistakes. So they are much more diligent afterward as they learn from their mistakes as well as their successes. They are human. Because of all this, they like to deal with well-experienced, reliable people and will keep responsible employees as long as they can. When people do leave for one reason or another, their organization, they try not to burn any bridges. As they may need the person again in the future, and vice versa. Often when people go their way, they do better than they did when they were here. And often they come back. Now, this new town manager that, that may, the fellow who's applied to be the new town manager may not be, but uh, he's applied. He was here before. And for one reason or another, he didn't stay. I think it was because he didn't, he, at the time, he was in a position where he couldn't become a resident. So he didn't stay. But he was here before, and he may come back again, and he may not. Entrepreneurs, although they learn from the past, do not like to dwell on the past, but they like to deal in the present and the future. Placing blame on past employees and past boards and past uh, people that used to be chairman of the boards and all that, it's not their style. We try not to do that. Again, once in a while, they will make a mistake, but in general, they're looking forward. They want to get to the next goal, not try to relive the past. Entrepreneurs not rely on committees and commissions. They use committees and commissions, and they respect them for what they do, but they don't rely on them, especially large committees and commissions. They prefer to replace responsibility on people, on the line management. Saw some of that this week, again, where they're re reaffirming that we want the responsibility to be with the town manager. I'm going to talk a bit more about that during the program. But they prefer to place the responsibility on people and hold them accountable. I mentioned that last week that, hey, people want responsibility. They want the responsible jobs, and they have them. But then they have to accept the accountability. So we have to make sure that people are given the responsibility, and then they're held accountable for decisions. And they don't try to blame those decisions on everybody else around them. That is how they grow people. Remember, I mentioned on a previous show that responsibility is fertilizer. That's how people grow. If you're trying to learn a, an instrument, you have to practice. And that's how you grow. They grow people, and it grows organizations. That's how they can move fast to obtain quicker results. 
Businessmen like to get results. They love results. They don't like to fail. They're not losers. They want to win. And this fuels them. They don't like to waste time with unnecessary detail. That's what I called in previous shows bicycle shedding. They don't want to waste time with unnecessary detail. What they want is the bottom line. Just give them the bottom line. They're used to working with bottom lines. If they want to know more, they will ask specific questions. They do not like to deal with generalities. No presentations, please. Just a one-page summary. We, the other night we had a presentation, I think it lasted an hour. It was introduced for five or 10 minutes. It was gonna last 10 or 15 minutes. And it went on for an hour or more. And in my opinion, it wasn't even a policy uh, type, uh, type thing. It should have been done with the town manager outside of the select meetings, in my opinion. What the businessmen want to see is a one-page summary, if not a one-sentence or two-sentence summary, at the selectman meeting. And they want to know what the bottom line is. And then they will ask questions. And then they should move the question and come to a vote as soon as possible. Entrepreneurs do not shrink from decision making. They are excellent decision makers. They're always trying to make decisions themselves or get people to make decisions and get all their direct reports to make decisions, get all the people in the organization to make decisions. They want that to happen. They do not try to palm decisions, pawn decision making off onto someone else when it should be their decision or pawn it off onto a committee or pawn it off, or pawn it off on to a commission. They'll make decisions when they are presented with a need for the same and will know that they may have to correct a percentage of them along the way so the mechanisms need to be there for that management by exception when, when the problems are pre, uh, given, when the feedback is given to them. Entrepreneurs like to keep things moving forward with minimal calculated risk. There is always risk involved, but we should try to make it minimal at all times. That's one of the reasons that they prefer evolutionary approaches rather than revolutionary approaches because it's quicker to, to see what's happening and to, to see if it's going in the right direction and to fix any problems as you go along. And lastly, I'd like to say here in this particular section that businessmen, especially entrepreneurs, are usually not crybabies. They don't tolerate crybabies very well. They are not paranoid. They do not think that any time something is mentioned in a selectman meeting that it's a criticism against them or it is negative feedback directed towards them as individuals. And they don't take uh, comments as being, unless they are specifically directed at them as individuals, they don't take them personally. They look for feedback and use it as a tool to improve their behavior and that of their organization. Now I hope this information that I just gave you and talked to you about will help you to understand the selectmen when you watch a selectman's meeting. It will help you to understand why it is so difficult for them to have a harmonious relationship throughout the whole group of selectmen. It's difficult for the minority because they don't have the same experiences as the majority. And it's difficult for the majority because they grew up in a different environment than the minority in this particular case. So it's always going to be a communication problem. 
And I did say when we were talking before the election that we, if we had all businessmen, then they would all be able to communicate properly and well. And they wouldn't be looking for um, why, does, why do these people do things differently than we did things in the last um, a group of selectmen. We did things differently before because hey, we had people with different experiences before. Um, and uh, as long as we have the businessmen in the majority, they will be trying to employ the techniques. That's why we elected them. We elected them because they have this approach, because they are this way, because they can help us get out of intensive care. So please take that into consideration. I do get a lot of people in town say, Brian, why don't they take more time? Why don't they go slower? Why don't they include everybody in all their decisions? And I say, well, you know, there's just some times when you, you're in intensive care, when you've got to get on with things and you've got to keep moving. And that's what's happening now. You're watching it before your very eyes and every week I will show you some examples of where, the, where these things happen and try to educate you all so that the next time when you vote, you will vote hopefully for more businessmen. Now I'm going to use the slides because I'm going to go over the meeting that happened on Monday, the selectmen's meeting with you, and I want to go through it and I want to point out some things. The first thing I want to say, and I want to be objective about this, is that uh, the policy non-policy ratio that I've been talking about on these meetings, on these programs, and I have a slide later to show you, was 18 to 1. There were 18 policy discussions in that meeting, give or take one. I think I might have made one mistake here, but, and one non-policy subject. Now when I say policy, I use the term very loosely because a lot of the things we do that, I call, that we call policy here right now are because the charter says we need to do them. In a business, probably out of those 18, 15 or 16 wouldn't even be there. They would have been delegated to the town manager. Now this was a very long meeting this time for several reasons. It should have been a, probably a half an hour meeting. It was more like a three hour meeting. I didn't time it, but and a lot of that was taken up by a presentation that I don't even think should have been in the meeting. That should have been given to the town manager in his office, and he should have given a brief summary to the selectmen and then gone from there, if at all. Basically, if you're in charge of the budget, which a town manager is, then you're going to want to be looking all the time for less expensive fuels and less expensive um, everything. Right? So that's the town manager's job, to do that all the time. You don't need a commission to do that. But what improvement that is, talking about 18 things that are policy in a policy meeting. That's wonderful. 18 to 1. What an improvement in just six weeks. Number two, the meeting was way too long. Way too long. The misunderstanding over the minutes was drawn out and shouldn't even have been there. I mean, that, that kind of stuff should be done before the meeting. Somebody call up Sheila, the town clerk, and say, um, hey, I think I have some problems in the minutes. Can you please correct them? And then if they are brought up at the, uh, at the selectmen meeting, it should be done much quicker than it was this time. In general, there was too much unnecessary discussion, in my opinion. The selectmen should have moved the question much faster than they did. Should have had a little bit of discussion on each issue, but not belabor the discussion and repeat that there's a lot of repetition. That people of that caliber shouldn't need the repetition. So they should have moved the question. I would encourage all the selectmen to move the question much sooner in most cases. Several selectmen, a few of the selectmen, not several, but a few of the selectmen, one or two, maybe three, selectmen made some comments in the meeting that probably were best left out of the meeting and not told 
and selectmen in front of TV and the newspaper and everything. So I would say, as selectmen, be careful that you don't say things like personnel things or that you um, make comments about what was said in other meetings, uh, which may or may not be true, and things like that. Uh, you should, should kind of avoid that. That's kind of getting back into the more non-business-like approach to running a meeting. Now I'm going to go through each of the things here. I've put colors on them. The green is for um, is for the, what I consider the uh, non-policy. These are all, I, people can argue with me about these, and they might win. Uh, but this is my Brian's view here. So please remember that it's Brian's view. Policy is uh, an interesting word. I gave you the definition many times. I'm not going to do that anymore. You can go to the dictionary yourself now if you want. But the biodiesel presentation was non-policy, in my opinion, unnecessary, should have been given to the town manager uh, in his office. And even if it was at the select meeting, it should have been held to the five or ten minutes that they said they were going to do. They said, I think, ten or fifteen minutes or whatever. But, you know, it got dragged out. It wasted a lot of people's time, including the public's time. And um, that's not good. Next was the good liaison reports. Thank you very much for the liaison reports. Um, they were informative, and uh, we're happy to see those. That was a policy. The town manager's report. I think, uh, and this is Brian's opinion only, and it's not criticism on anybody right now. We have brand new town manager, interim town manager. And uh, he's finding his feet, and it takes him a little while to get on there. And I did have a meeting with him this week for an hour or so. It was very productive. I'm very impressed with him and his ability to lateral think. I'll use some examples of that in the future programs from examples I talked to him about. But um, the town manager's report, uh, uh, in my opinion, the first thing that should be on it, as I said in previous programs, is where do we stand on the budget, this year's budget? Uh, are we on budget or not? And has, has anything uh, been done this week to uh, keep us, last two weeks, to keep us on budget? And when I say budget, I mean revenue and expense. Not just expense, but the revenue and expense. Um, the other thing I think that needs to be done in the town manager report is we need to be able to start getting some visibility into the 208-209 revenue and budget planning progress. Projection, progress projections probably need some policy direction, like from the selectmen, what, what it will be our policy for the next year's budget? Uh, needs to be something said about that to the town manager so he can then plan the budget with his people in a, in a uh, cooperative manner and be back by Mar the March 15th deadline that uh, he has by charter to bring a budget to the selectmen. I think the bottom-up approach that, uh, that we've been, is again, just Brian's view, the bottom-up approach that we've been taking is that's one of the reasons we have all these referendums. If we give them a, uh, a target and say that will perhaps be satisfactory for the town and the taxpayers uh, and the Board of Education, uh, although the, never, not everybody will always be happy with these things, then maybe we can give some top-down direction. Then the people can go off and do their budgets accordingly we won't have to have the, all these uh, reviews at the selectman level over every penny and, uh, and go, go around and around and around with many referendums. Nobody wants to repeat the seven referendum thing we went through a few years ago. So I think we ought to be talking more about that. This should be the second thing on the town manager's report. What he did talk about, though, and I didn't put down everything he talked about, but he did say there's a 30-year-old generator in the town hall that uh, the police are dependent on, and if it doesn't work. And when I went to the police meeting, they did say they were out for one or two days um, at one time with all their computers, and that means when their computers are out, their business pretty well shuts down. So um, not, not, not the policemen on the street and all, but uh, it is, you know, they kind of run their business now with the computers, and they're very necessary. So that was brought up, and I'm sure that'll be looked into. The good news on the retirement side is that the retirement fund is in excellent shape. And as you know, around the world, around America now, there are a lot of retirements that aren't in excellent shape. So uh, the retirement fund looks uh, like it's in pretty good shape. People are happy with that. A 
Look at all that red. That means policy when you see this slide. Um, there you go. Uh, we reinforce the town manager's personally, personal responsibility. That's always been our policy. Somewhere it got lost along the way, I think, and people weren't really following it as uh, thoroughly as they should have. And uh, that has been reinforced by the mayor and the selectmen, and the town manager is, uh, uh, is responsible for the personnel, uh, and, and um, it's, his, it's his ball of wax there. Carry Avenue Lots. That I think was good. They're uh, devoted to on that on the on the sale of those. Norcross Road to the public uh, meeting is um, uh, want to put it out for sale, and they have to go to a public meeting for that. That'll be on January 21st at 7 p.m. That's positive, and I'm glad to see that. Uh, the, the the collector of revenue uh, refunds were approved. That's good. That has to come to the selectmen under the existing charter. Uh, clarify the town manager's compensation, part of the previous motion, I think it was table. I think that was more of a clarification thing like, you know, what was it part of the, uh, um, was it part of the motion that was held when we, when we uh, agreed to have the, the interim town manager or not? That'll be clarified, I hope, by the next meeting, if not before. Uh, discuss the town manager search. There was a, a long, drawn out conversation about that. Uh, and uh, that went into executive session, which happened on uh, Wednesday, December 19th. And uh, from what I gather, they interviewed the candidate, and uh, they have now put in, uh, into place a process for uh, finding a new town manager interim or not by um, the 1st of March. There's a series of steps there. They're all in the newspaper. You can see those. But they're hoping by the 1st of March, to have a, a, uh, a town manager, another interim town manager, uh, perhaps longer if the charter does not get revised. Public works contract, that was the surprise. There hasn't been any since June of 07. They were working on it. That's not good enough, uh, and, but we got to get it done. So that was also discussed was supposed to be discussed. I don't know. I don't know what happened in the executive session, but that was supposed to be dis discussed in the same executive session on December 19th. Uh, but that's a personnel matter, so uh, didn't make the newspapers. The next is the town manager was uh, was uh, approved to sign the Still River Agreement. That's good. Um, the next was a motion to appoint a town attorney. There was a long discussion about that, and uh, that was tabled, uh, probably for good reason. Uh, there was some uh, confusion about it. That was uh, good feedback that people gave, and uh, there will be action taken on that one way or another. We'll find out at the next meeting, uh, when they have the next select meeting, what will happen there. There were differences of opinion about how the whole thing went, so it was tabled, and uh, we'll find out what happens next time. Um, they wanted to form an energy commission. They tabled that. I think that's bad that they tabled it. I think they should not even bother with it. But uh, again, that's just Brian's opinion. We don't need one of those. What you do is you tell the town manager every time somebody in public works or wherever goes around to change a light bulb, they put in one of the new ones and maybe even have a plan to go ahead and put in all the new ones. But that's really the town manager's responsibility to make sure that we use our budgets efficiently when it comes to energy. So um, I don't really think they need a commission to go around counting light bulbs, like was pointed out in the program. Now, I'm not trying to demean anybody in that. I think the, the energy policy you know, all is very important, and that we do keep up with the state of the art, and that we do things that we can afford and that are cost uh, productive. But uh, I don't think we need a commission for that. I think that's uh, a mistake if we do that. Doesn't mean we won't get a commission. It just means that Brian doesn't think we need one. Um, next is that we uh, we approve the uh, police department fund transfer. That's another thing I think that perhaps uh, is a charter thing. Uh, uh, there was a small amount of money. It was moved from one one line item in the budget to another. But anyway, it was done in a short period of time and was positive. Um, 
It did take a while for it to get there, though. You see, these meetings only happen every two weeks. So meanwhile, the poor police department is waiting for these decisions to be made. And uh, this came up at a couple of selectmen meetings, so it could be take a whole month to get some kind of these decisions made. That's the problem with bringing them all up to the selectmen level. So if the charter is revised, that's something they probably should have a pretty good look at. They dissolved two commissions. Good, in my opinion. <laughs> Whenever you dissolve a commission, that's good. Put the responsibility on line management. Now, commissions are good in general. There are some commissions you need, and we have some. We have an NOL commission, which is necessary. We have a planning and zoning commission. We have a development commission, those kind of commissions. But you really got to be careful when you, when you start establishing commissions. And so not to have them is probably better than having them. Um, uh, Commissions and uh, committees tend to be um, tools used in big uh, bureaucracies and small bureaucracies. Uh, I've had people tell me, Brian, you don't understand. Government moves slow, <laughs> very slow, you know. And I say, well, you don't understand. All governments have a mechanism to also move fast when they have to. They can't just move slow. We had to get the uh, year 2000 changes in by the year 2000, you know. We couldn't move slow, we had to move fast. So all governments are set up to move fast when they have to. We can do that too. The tax deferral plan was tabled because uh, for one reason or another we didn't get around to getting the data necessary. And the Winsett Furniture Company, uh, which is even questionable whether it's a policy issue or not, uh, but I put it down as policy, give them the benefit of the doubt because one of the things they want to do is get the policy squared away for all these buildings, old buildings we have down here in the center of town. So now, uh, the colors I use, I put on here, I don't know if you can see them on there, I'll just lift this up a second, but policy, non-policy, policy's red, non-policy's green, and Brian's comments are in yellow. So that's what's happening there. Now we're gonna talk a bit about the financial update for today. Um, you just leave it on there, okay. Uh, Revaluation, re the division appraisal meetings with residents are taking place and um, people are going in now and asking why. Why did things happen the way they did? The initial 2000-2009 uh, uh, budget mill rate will be available to the selectmen around March 15th by charter. There were questions about that in the selectmen meeting, but the charter is very specific about when the mill rate is calculated. There's one calculated on March 15th. That's a, very, that's a rough one when the town manager gives his, it's needed for the town manager to give his budget to the selectmen. And then there's a final one calculated, right, so, so right in the charter, uh, will be available shortly after the approval of the budget at the referendum. This year's budget has been forecast as running over, as we all know, doesn't mean it will run over, and they're working on that, but uh, uh, it's been forecast as running over, and a spending freeze is still in place. Um, remember, that spending freeze doesn't apply to contracts that we, we have committed to. We have to keep going with those um, as we stand now. And we have not yet, as I know, put a hiring freeze on, on the town. Okay, the next is we have to look forward to hearing the latest budget status from the town manager, I hope, the message is Brian's wish, at the next selectman's meeting. Doesn't mean it'll be there then, but that's what I'd like to see. I have some references here from the town charter. I'll just put them up there. You can all go get the charter in the town hall, and you can see all these references to when the mill rate is calculated and when it should be given out. And there's a reason for that. The reason is if you give the mill rate out too quickly when we haven't even finished any of the work yet, all the work yet, then it's, it's not good. It misleads uh, people, and uh, unless you're really an expert on the mill rate, which few people are, it's very confusing for the majority of taxpayers. That's why that's in the charter, and uh, it'll probably stay there for quite a long time. Notices for this week. Number one, an interview was held on Wednesday night uh, with, the town, with the one town manager candidate who happened to be in town for personal reasons and asked for an interview. Um, his name is Paul Vayer. Uh, I can only say that because the newspapers had it in there this morning, a uh, former town manager. I don't know the person. I wasn't here when he was town manager. Can't give you opinion one way or the other. Um, a schedule has been agreed unanimously by the selectmen, according to the newspaper, um, 
for interviewing and hiring a new town manager to be on board by March 1st, 2007. That's very important because uh, the existing um, interim town manager must leave at the end of February. Some December revaluation uh, re re results are being appealed now as we speak. Look at your notice for the final appeal date with the Town Appeals Board. I don't know whether that's up or not, but it's on the notice that was sent to you with your new re reval um, assessed value. Now, I'm going to give you some of the revaluation criteria because everybody keeps asking me about it. And uh, I went to a special meeting with the, uh, the other day with uh, several people. There was one selectman there and uh, people from the assessor's office and one of the officials from Vision Appraisal. And we went over things for an hour, an hour and a half or so. And I just want to say that here's the kind of criteria. That there's a whole book in the assessor's office. It's got a brown cover on it. It tells you all the things they do when they do an assessment. How many, they count this, they count that, they include this, they include that. But I'm just going to give you right now, just because everybody's so curious about it, very high level look. The sales over the last two years is what they use in, the, in, in your area and around in your neighborhood. And when you go for, uh, and you go to get uh, your, your appeal reviewed with vision appraisal, they have pictures of all these houses that have sold in the last couple of years right in the hallway in the town hall and you can see, you can see some of them. I'm not sure they got them all there, but they got, a, they got most of them, I think. At least, at least they got samples from each area of town so you can get an idea in your area of town what has sold. The other thing is they're very, very interested in topography, and especially areas that are in hilly areas or very slopey areas or very flat areas. There's so many differences, infinite number of differences in topography. They've categorized them, and uh, they go around and they check topography, and they give you a plus or a minus or an, or an even based upon your topography. Um, they're always balancing things. They're always trying to look around town to see if things are balanced and that one areas and being treated unfairly over another. Adjustments are made all the time during the last five years since the last reval, so they have to bring all the, everything up to date with all the adjustments that have been made, make sure they're relayed around town fairly. Um, the change in quality, if there's been any change in quality in your house, you've added to it or subtracted from it or uh, whatever, then the, or it's deteriorated, they will either give you a plus or a minus or an even for that. The condition of the house, if it's paint's all peeling off or this and that, you might get uh, a deduction for that. If, uh, um, and if it's an excellent condition, you'll have a different value than somebody who's in poor or mediocre condition. Uh, location's very important, whether you're on the lake or in the town of Winchester or um, live next to a big silo or something that uh, um, uh, you will get a different of you there. And of course, view is important to them, very important. Uh, they, uh, they measure that everywhere they go, not just around here. And they have, I don't know, 10 gradients of you, and you fall into one of the categories. And they'll tell you which one you fall into if you go down and talk to them. Now, I separated the lake out here because the lake uh, has water access. Other places, there's other lakes too. I'm just talking about any lake here. And uh, you're either on the water or off the water or have access to the water. And they give you different um, uh, scales for that. And then uh, Highland Lake in particular, they used to have three regions up there. Now they've got two. So that was a change that was made in the last five years that has confused people a bit. So the meeting was held on December 18th and uh, with vision appraisal. And I was in attendance there. And I, I, uh, I reviewed my list of questions that I had talked to you about on the a program over the, over the weeks. Uh, and uh, I went over the questions and I got my answers. And, uh, in addition to that, I went in and reviewed my own property with vision appraisal and got a good understanding there. There were one or two mistakes on my card, and uh, they're going to take that into consideration. I don't know whether it'll add tax or decrease tax, but, uh, but I did what I wanted to do so that I could better understand how my house was evaluated and how all the houses were evaluated and how the lake was evaluated uh, one side versus the other and also the lake versus the rest of the town. So. Um, I personally got a lot out of it, and I thank Vision Appraisal and the town employees for working and letting us do that. Now I'd like to put up a hospitality 
hospitality, I always have trouble with the word, policy. Um, and this here is a little tough love. I want to say that uh, the Inland Wetland Commission, in my opinion, is a very good commission. They do a lot of good work. We have to have them by state uh, law, statute, and we need them anyway. And uh, I've always said on this program that barring one thing, I think uh, they're excellent. Uh, but as far as hospitality is concerned, um, we have a developer trying to come to town and uh, spend $300 million improving our, our town at a time when we are in great need. We're in intensive care for revenue. Um, it was scheduled in the last Inland Wetlands to begin the Winchester State uh, uh, Second Review. And he had to sit in there with his expert until 11 o'clock until he got on the agenda. He came from afar, you know, an hour or so away. He had to sit there at 11 p.m. or so to be heard. Um, his expert, he had to pay his expert to do that, and the expert had to sit there as well. And then they had to go home afterwards. It could have been even later. I've seen it happen later. It could have been earlier, too. But uh, part of the reason he was on the end of the agenda was because he, he handed in, you know, his application came in pretty late in the process. I understand that. But if the meeting didn't last till 11 p.m., he wouldn't have had to stay there till 11 p.m. So I have a real problem with that, and uh, I think we can do better. We need to treat our guests more hospitably and uh, especially people who are trying to improve our town for us and uh, make it better for us and them. Um, I have submitted my suggestions that I mentioned on the program last week. I have submitted those uh, suggestions to the Inland Wetland Commission and asked them to give them to each of the commissioners and asked them to consider trying to get that meeting to be an hour, an hour and a half instead of going on till 11 o'clock at night. And I would say that if we do have guests that are coming in and we're trying to get them to come to our town, we should have a welcome mat there and we should treat them with more, uh, a higher sense of urgency as far as priorities are concerned. Not to say they, uh, you know, guests have to be treated like guests and uh, if we, needed a, we need them, then I think everybody will understand if we give them a little priority on some of these kind of things. Very expensive to have these experts in meetings sitting around waiting for their turn. Um, and I don't think we can even tell them usually what time they would be on, so they would come at 10 for an 11 o'clock uh, thing. So the, the reason they come at the beginning is because they never quite know when they're going to be summoned, and they want to be there when it's their turn. So anyway, I've put them in. I hope, I hope it uh, improves the situation. I don't hold much hope, but I'm going to keep trying until we get going there. Upwards pressure on the budget. Um, this is one I always try to keep up, and I'll update it from time to time. This is for next year's budget, 208, uh, 209. And the debt we carry over, I've had this slide up before. It's not a surprise. Uh, will be 428, 765, give or take. Uh, that's for the uh, last bond issue and carry over the school debt. Uh, that we still have for one more year. The year after that, we won't have any for that. Um, and then we have uh, estimated uh, expense for the town of about one mil, which is right now about 588,080,000. Uh, and then we have the new field road, uh, which has uh, been approved, and our matching part is 57,400. That comes out to 1,074,245 which is about 1.83 mills using the existing mill uh, thing, uh, or 5.33%. I think next week, because we don't have a selecting meeting next week, I'm going to get, talk more about the whole, all, all how this stuff is structured and uh, uh, how we go for money and what we need and how, much, how matching funds affect us and all that kind of thing. So next week, uh, we don't. Now, we do know there are things in back of this that are coming along. Pearson, uh, we know we have to fund the schools a little more next year for uh, raises and things like that. And, you know, there's a contract going on now there. So there are other issues that'll come up. This is not definitive. This is just to give you an idea that, uh, you know, the pressures will be upward on the next year budget, not downward. So we're going to have to manage that. Now, I'm going to put the major status thing up from, from the last meeting, but nothing's really changed on here. I did add the color yellow because yellow means they haven't started on it yet. So. Yellow means not started, but basically the major status hasn't changed much this time. 
We still need to get that five-year financial thing going. We still need to produce a plan to achieve the one to five-year financial objectives. And we still need to get going on reviewing, making decisions when necessarily quarterly for that uh, number six. But um, that stuff is moving along, but in my opinion, too slow. We need to move faster in that area. So uh, that's Brian's two cents. You know, when you have a program like this, it's hard work, it takes a lot of time. The one satisfaction is you get to put in your two cents. <laughs> you can say what you think. Total discussions to date, policy versus non-policy. You can see how we're improving. We started out, uh, the last few meetings were 22 policy, 10 non-policy. This meeting was 18 policy, one non-policy. 40, 11. So we're going in the right direction here. This is excellent. I hope we can keep it up. And again, if we can get the charter changed a bit and we can have a lot of these things delegated to the town manager, these meetings will be half an hour to an hour and they'll probably only need it once a month instead of twice a month. So I think that's great. And I gave them the benefit of doubt. It was a bit of a rocky meeting this time. So for my last slide today, I'm going to say the uh, business-like, yes, I gave it a business-like. If anybody disagrees with that, let me know and I'll correct it next time. But it was, was business-like. There wasn't uh, there wasn't any sniping and snarling. There were a few funny comments, but uh, in general, it was it was relative to to the last uh, uh, group of selectmen. This was a calm, uh, uh, business-like meeting. So um, we got to be careful though, because it's heading in the wrong direction right now. We need to we need to quicken it up and be more business-like and continue. I'll continue to harp on that as long as I'm alive to do so. With that. Thank you very much. I will be going right through the Christmas and New Year's. Uh, I was very lucky. My time for both taping and my show are on days when uh, we have access here. So I'll be in town. I'll be having a show every week. And I'm going to try to sneak in some stuff in the non-selectman weeks that gives more and more information to you about how the town operates and how it runs. And with that, I say thank you very much. Have a Merry Christmas.